feedback. Okay, I think we had some feedback there, but um, proud to welcome everyone to the uh, proud mm -hmm. to welcome everyone to the second annual. Uh, uh, we are being Maryland uh, Veterans Symposium. Uh, we are being uh, carries live streamed on Facebook, and so uh, we're going to be talking about you know women's veterans health care. You know, a very very, very important topic. And so before we get started, um, I want to uh, introduce a couple people who, who really don't need any introduction. So the first person that I'd like to introduce to bring greetings, Tim, Sheree Sample Hughes, who represents uh, Legislative District 37A. And so um, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, the floor is yours. We got to unmute this. Recording in progress. on the line seems like it's about 26 people here good afternoon can anyone hear me recording stopped yes i hear you Okay, good. I think that there's some technical. We're here at the American Legion, and I think I'm going to have to have Delia Rogers. He doesn't know this just yet. Come outside. <laughs> so please stand by for a few moments. Uh, I think, Pat, he's going to be able to join you. So give me one second. <laughs> I think that's all it is. But here, this is me. No, you got to push it on.
Garrett. Hello. We can hear you, can't see you. Okay. Okay, Delegate Rogers, can you hear me now? All right, he is coming in. All right, good. I'm good. I'm in. Thanks. You got it. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> is he in? Okay, uh, is everyone able to hear me? Loud and yes. Clear. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. Um, so we're we're going to try this again. We've had some technical difficulties uh, coming to you live from the American Legion, but I think we've got that there. So at this point, I'm going to ask if uh, uh, Delegate Shree Sample Hughes is on the line for her to offer some greetings. Good evening, everyone. As you can see, as you can see, uh, we are resilient and we are fighters. We get through any tough situation mm -hmm. and we uh, make make sure that things are done in proper and in order as Delegate Rogers is outside reporting from the American Legion this evening. But I'm Delegate Sheree Sample Hughes, the Speaker Pro Tem for the Maryland General mm -hmm. Assembly, the Maryland House of Delegates specifically. And it's an honor to be with you on tonight to bring greetings um, because I know firsthand that the members in our chambers in the General Assembly are promoting the wherewithal and all that can be done, whether through policy or whether through a small prayer or whatever the case may be to honor our veterans. And that is in very important to the Speaker of the House. It's important to me personally, as I grew up uh, through the American Legion Auxiliary and I always hold our veterans close to my heart. So I just like to congratulate uh, the Veterans Caucus, Delegate Rogers specifically for um, making sure that the needs and the priorities of veterans are and stay a part of our daily walk. Um, as you know, we in the General Assembly have made it a point to ensure that women's veterans issues are a priority, that health care is a priority, making sure those resources are available. And I want to let you know we can continue to be that partner and to continue to be that strength. Thank you all for being here tonight, and we are certainly going to keep fighting the good fight for our veterans. Thank you, Delegate Rogers. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker Pro Tem, uh, Sheree Sample Hughes. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask our, our Secretary, uh, Secretary George Owens, to, to offer a few remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate uh, Colonel Retired Rogers. It's an honor to be here this evening, and uh, the topic could be better as well, I have someone we're gonna to introduce to those that have yet to meet her in just a few moments. But on behalf of Governor Hogan, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford, I bring you greetings from the entire team at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, tonight, of course, uh, whoever's on the call and who has served in the United States, listen, uniform services, I wanna wish them a very happy Veterans Day. And for those of you that say, what is a uniform service? There are two branches of government that are not considered to be armed services. They are NOAA and they are the uh, public health side. So to all seven branches, uh, I guess it's eight now with the uh, space uh, force in place. Uh, I bring uh, the best of uh, uh, Veterans Day's greetings. Uh, the symposium tonight could not be more, uh, what should I say, more effective because we are dealing specifically tonight with women veterans, I believe. And uh, it gives me a great uh, deal of pleasure to offer up at this time 
uh, the introduction of Rosalind Jones. Rosalind Jones is a retired veteran. Rosalind Jones was recently uh, brought over from the uh, uh, Department of Labor to fill a big need. And uh, Delegate uh, Sample Hughes, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank all the members of the Women's Caucus for putting such pressure uh, on the powers that be to allow us to bring this. I saw Delegate Brooks smiling. He had something to do with it too. Uh, as a veteran, thank you very much. Pat Young, thank you for your service as well. But uh, the pressure came to bear and finally we were able to bring in somebody to this department that deals specifically with the women's veterans of this state. There are approximately 54,000 women veterans and so often the women veteran is just forgotten. Um, I think I saw, uh, let me see, uh, did I see? Well, I'll find her in a minute. Uh, anyway, I wanted to thank her for her service. Gloria Den, I see you up there. Thank you as well, uh, very much. Um, but in any event, uh, tonight, uh, Rosalind Jones is is, uh, is joining us. You see her just coming on. She is our new uh, program manager for Women Veterans Inclusion. And yesterday was her birthday, but she hit the ground running about, uh, I guess, two months ago. Uh, we're also joined by the uh, director of outreach and advocacy and uh, soon to be communications. That's Dana Burrow is also with us this evening. So let me get back to what I was saying. Um, uh, the governor recognized the need uh, to dedicate resources to this new program. And so he gave us a pen and we immediately filled it. Uh, Labor was not too happy that we went over and, and uh, actually kind of coerced them to let Rosalind come visit us uh, and become a part of the family. But uh, hopefully in the future, uh, Delegate Rogers, you'll give her an opportunity to, uh, to speak about what it is that she's uh, gonna do. One week ago today, she launched the program. We had 90 participants. And so effective was it that the event actually brought people together, women specifically from California, uh, as far away as uh, as far away as California, I think Washington State had joined us. Uh, and just, you know, all across this country, we had participants. It was well advertised, and some of you may have even been on that. But we all know going back as far as the Revolutionary War, that women have been an intricate part of the military. And since then, in every branch, uh, women have served and sacrificed just as every man has. So the population is growing, as I said, and the needs uh, couldn't be any greater than they are at this point in time. And I tell you, I wish I could stay and hear the whole, uh, the whole program, but I am in my 12th hour and ninth minute of being here today, preparing for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is our other very busy day. So again, for all of those of you that are participating in tonight's event, let me talk to you now. Rosalind Jones is our um, Women Veterans Inclusion Program Manager, and you can reach her at 410-260-3971. Let me give that to you again, 410-260-3971. And I wanna thank you again, uh, uh, Colonel, uh, for allowing me these few moments, and I will be leaving you all very shortly as I uh, have some work yet to do preparing for tomorrow. Thank you again. Well, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for those remarks. And, and I look forward to working with Rosalind in your office and, and actually meeting her. And um, I was temporarily taken offline, but if you, in case you didn't say it, I wanna take this opportunity to, read, uh, to uh, wish the United States Marine Corps a happy 246th birthday. And so with that, I, I'm gonna turn it over to the other Marine on the call and that will be Delegate uh, Pat Young. Good evening, everybody and greetings from Glasgow, Scotland. I am uh, here at the COP26 UN Climate Conference. So I apologize for uh, the background. Uh, one, I told Mike I wouldn't miss this uh, when we first set this up. Didn't realize I was going to be in Scotland, but uh, the topical piece is that I'm here because of my work with other legislators from around the country and many of those legislators from the uh, um, from this association have military experience which is how i got invited to come down here fighting for climate change fighting for maryland and fighting for our communities and re recognizing that not only do we have a special relationship with the environment with the chesapeake bay but we have a special uh, relationship one being veterans that have served overseas and seen the impacts of conflicts that have taken place in other nations due to our insecurity related to our um, uh, one 
our renewable, our non-renewable fuel sources, our reliance on fossil fuels, and bringing a new perspective uh, to fight for that. The important thing tonight is that one, you're here, and that Mike Rogers uh, is a uh, the consummate champion of veterans in the in the, in the legislature. Uh, I'm serving this year as the chair of the Veterans Caucus. Uh, and hopefully leaving behind a uh, legacy of organization that he will pick up and others uh, that are currently in the House now to make sure that this advocacy and this attention to veterans issues uh, stays at the top of leadership's list and make sure that the secretary is supported, that the caucus is supported, that female vets are supported, and that everyone that we've been serving and serve for uh, receiving the benefits and the need and the uh, services that they deserve and that they need. I appreciate the opportunity to, to thank, to one, say welcome. Thank you from the Veterans Caucus. Thank you, uh, Delegate Rogers, Mr. Secretary. I see we have Delegate Ben Brooks on the call as well. Uh, your support for everything we do is imperative, and I can't thank you enough for the support and the opportunity to say hi and bring greetings from Scotland. Thank you. Well, uh, Delegate Young, really appreciate you taking the time to, to come and, and, and speak to everyone this evening. Uh, it just it, it just means the world, all the way from Scott. And I know you recognize uh, Delegate Ben Brooks, but I know we also have my good friend, Delegate Heather Bagnall on the call. Um, she's a staunch supporter of veterans as well and happy that she was able to dial in. Uh, I don't know if um, Delegate uh, Chris Valderrama is on the call. I'm She's here. planning to, to, to bring here. greetings. Okay, Chris, well, I know you want to bring greetings from the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, so the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, I actually was on before you, Mike. <laughs> um, I just want to say, and I apologize to everyone on this Zoom that I'm not showing myself. For many of you, I don't want to say just mothers here, but parents, uh, I committed to Mike, I don't know, two months ago, I think. And I had every intention of showing myself. And let's just put it this way, ladies. I left the house at 11 this morning um, and I never have been home yet. So a, a lot of things have just popped up on my schedule that was not planned. Um, not good things necessarily, but you know how our schedules can be. So, but I didn't want to not um, be present, uh, at least by audio. So I just want to, uh, as the current chair of the Asian Pacific American Caucus of the Maryland General Assembly, but also the outgoing this upcoming session, I too uh, wanted to bring greetings to the Women's Veterans Healthcare Symposium. And I wanted to thank your moderator, Delegate Mike Rogers for the invitation. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the panelists, Ms. Nicole Wallace, uh, Dr. Carden, Carlin, and Ms. Gloria Dent for your service and for providing this information this evening for everyone on this call. Um, having said that, I also wanted to acknowledge, I think he left the call already, uh, Secretary Owings and my colleagues, I would be remiss, uh, uh, Delegate Brooks, Delegate Cherie Sample Hughes, uh, Delegate Bagnall. Uh, if I missed anyone, I apologize. I, I recognize Delegate Rogers. I wanted to just say, uh, as I've said to many veterans who have come through the Maryland General Assembly, I myself was not raised in a military family, but was raised with a lot of family and friends who are or who have been. And so I understand uh, the mission and I understand, I, I much, very much value the service that you all provide. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. Having said that, I just wanted to let those on this call know and to share it throughout that my door is always open to the veterans, our women veterans, and happy to work with you, whether it's legislation, policy, or otherwise. Uh, thank you so much for your service, and thank you, Delegate Rogers, for the inclusion and giving remarks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Delegate Valderrama. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that um, this evening, and I know that you won't be able to stay on the call the entire time, but hopefully you will pick up some uh, valuable information for the time that you are able to stay. And I know the other caucus chair that I wanted to recognize at this time, if he's on the line, is uh, the chair of the uh, Maryland Legislative Black Caucus, uh, Delegate Daryl Barnes. Are, are you there? Okay, it sounds like he may be joining us um, a little bit later. I know he had another commitment as well, but he really wanted to take the opportunity as a former Army and Navy veteran to come on and say a couple words. So 
we will make sure uh, uh, that we bring him on uh, to bring greetings once he is able to uh, come online. So at this point, we're going to uh, move to our panelists. And at, I want to start with Miss um, Carlin and uh, Lisa, is she, Carlin is the owner of the Trump Resilience and Education Center of Greater Washington, which is a collective of psychotherapists, educators with decades of experience dedicated to providing evidence-based and trauma-informed services. Lisa has extensive experience working with trauma survivors, uh, in the in the DC area to include um, many veterans and you know working with the uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Medical Center, so uh, she is up, she she is familiar and experienced in training in a number of te techniques to include acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, uh, uh, cognitive processing therapy CPT, prolonged exposure therapy, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. So as you can see, she's very, very well adept at a number of therapies, helping uh, veterans who face various behavioral challenges. So without further ado, um, I present to you, uh, Ms. Lisa Carlin. All right, thank you so much. It's uh, so honored to be here today. Um, I, I hope everyone can hear me okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for the head nods. Um, yes, thank you for that introduction. Again, I am just honored to be here with you all. Um, I also just want to, uh, you know, say a early happy Veterans Day to all of you veterans here on the call. Um, I am not a veteran myself. I have many family members, including my my father, my grandfather, a couple of brothers-in-law, and some some close friends that have served or are currently serving. So very much uh, an event that's close to my heart here tonight, um, uh, especially for some of the, the wonderful friends, uh, especially women veterans that I, I call friends that I'm so glad that there is such attention to. Um, I, I lost track of who was speaking earlier, but I heard someone refer to women veterans that can be sometimes the forgotten um, veterans here. And uh, I, I just appreciate that being, I think, I think that's hopefully becoming less and less, especially with events like this and positions like you're all bringing in, that's fantastic. Um, I, I can certainly speak to um, situations where I've worked with clients at the VA who, you know, their first, you know, contact with folks was asking, you know, where their husband was, right, and not recognizing themselves as the veteran. So I think we're coming a long way to have events like this, positions open up. I'm so grateful to be here speaking with you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if that's all right, because I will be presenting some information to some general overview information about um, women veteran mental health, um, as well as some resources. So I think I can go ahead and do that. Um, okay. Don't take a trust with or All right. I think folks can see this okay. Um, so I just want to, uh, I, I appreciate the introduction. I um, did work for several years. I, I've been working with trauma veterans for about 20 years now. Uh, I'm sorry, for, with trauma survivors for about 20 years now. About 10 years of those were within the VA Medical Center um, as a psychologist and as a, a prior to that, a psychology trainee. Um, now working with uh, Trek DC, a uh, uh, collective I founded with um, some colleagues that continue to serve uh, survivors of trauma of many different areas. Um, so I just want to give credit to my colleague, Dr. Leah Didion, who helped me to compile these slides for tonight. Um, so I, I will give a brief overview of some information on women veterans experiences and mental health, um, some resources for veterans as well as friends and family. I know others um, on the panel will be talking about um, specific information within the VA system. So I'll, I'll defer that to them tonight, um, but we'll provide some other resources outside of the system or to help connect to the system. Um, and of course, any of this information is not meant to be uh, comprehensive um, and there are certainly you know, one woman veteran is not the same as the other. So, um, you know, please, please keep that in mind as I'm giving some of these overviews, but I hope can give some, an overshot of just things to consider when we're talking about um, this group of women. Can you give them a place to be a kid? Can you be there somewhere? Yeah, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback if, if folks don't mind muting themselves. We're in the county department of social services today to learn about becoming a foster parent. Oh, Open I think them. we might have a, video on the background. Okay, great. I do like to start um, presentations uh, just to 
Um, start with protective factors. I mean, there's so much I don't have to tell you all, especially those of you who served, um, about all that comes from service or from folks that are led to service. I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, just a few of those protective factors I have listed here about folks coming in um, and, and leaving with a sense of meaning and purpose that have learned to work in a highly structured environment that it also fosters independence um, at the same time of working, of course, with others and um, just such camaraderie that comes from that, as well as leadership skills um, all up and down the chain. Um, as we all know, or might be familiar with, sometimes transitioning to a civilian environment um, can make uh, that challenging when uh, structure is not quite the same as it was in service, um, but want to not lose sight of these as potential uh, protective factors for folks as well, even though we might be talking about some added challenges. So just some overview facts about women veterans. Um, and I will note that um, these numbers, we don't yet have numbers in um, from peer reviewed journals of the impact of the pandemic. So I do wanna say that most of these um, these numbers I'm presenting tonight are pre-pandemic or came out that, that don't account for the pandemic impact. So uh, again, please bear that in mind. But in general, um, just before the pandemic, we were seeing that there were higher unemployment rates um, within women veteran populations as compared to male veterans. Um, compared to male veterans, um, working women tended to be younger, more highly educated, uh, more likely to identify as a racial or ethnic minority. Um, more likely to be in the labor force and more likely to be enrolled in school. Um, so, you know, just some, some differences to keep in mind. Um, also of note is that women veterans were two to four times more likely to be homeless than non-veteran women. So the, the top bullets there were comparing uh, veteran women to men, but then that um, statistic I think is important to keep in mind about um, the differences that we see between veteran women and non-veteran women. Um, one uh, aspect of uh, uh, someone's experience that may have occurred during their military service is something that's referred to as military sexual trauma. Um, I am not sure if folks' familiarity with this term, so I just wanted to define it a bit, that it's actually defined um, for federal law as a psychological trauma that could be the result of a physical assault um, or sexual harassment, which includes verbal harassment that was repeated and unsolicited um, of a verbal or physical contact. And this is important when talking about um, the impact um, of mental health in women veterans, of course, this is not something that just happens to women veterans, but women veterans are more likely to have experienced military sexual trauma. Also more likely to have experienced um, harassment, um, not just within their military service, but also prior to military service. So you can see some statistics here, as well as some um, important initiatives that have been provided by the active duty um, service as well as um, through the VA on helping with prevention and response. Um, there's also been some recent actions that have improved response for not just women veterans, but also male veterans that experience sexual assault and harassment, but continues to be a very challenging experience. You can see that one in three military women will experience sexual assault during their military service. Also wanted to highlight the impact of intimate partner violence. Um, and so again, this is something that certainly we just still uh, just recognized um, uh, domestic violence and intimate partner violence awareness month in October. Um, so, so I'm sure folks have some, um, some experience or some um, knowledge of this already, but just important to note too, that um, almost one in five women here using VA healthcare screened positive for experiencing interpersonal violence during the past year. Um, and that women veterans and service members are three times more likely than non-veteran women to experience IPV. Um, and, and again, here we're seeing some of the uh, overlap of those who've experienced military sexual trauma were twice as likely to experience intimate, um, intimate partner violence as well. So really seeing how um, this population often um, experiences more risk and um, experiences of trauma. Also wanted to highlight um, the uh, just awareness around suicide around military women. Suicide rates for women veterans is two and a half times greater Recording than non veteran in women. Um, and as compared to civilian women, more likely to die by suicide from a gunshot. So we can see the factors associated with stress and suicide are not different than perhaps you might see um, for uh, other veterans um, or for 
um, non-veteran women, but you know the the rates of suicide are really of importance and for us to be paying attention to. You can see some of those factors listed of of course, our loss, um, deployment, and other trauma, such as what I noted of sexual victimization, uh, workload conflicts, prior mental health history, of course, familiarity with firearms, as well as additional uh, factors, including insomnia and depression. And again, here we're seeing the rate higher for those who experience sexual trauma. So, of course, we're seeing that theme come across here is that the impact of trauma um, can really have just such. Um, uh, such negative impact here um, without treatment. Okay. And I know we were familiar with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but a few notes about that, that of course um, there is a higher prevalence of PTSD within, um, within women veterans populations. Um, interestingly, that when controlling for other risk factors, um, uh, PTSD rates still remain higher for women veterans compared to men, but not between women. It's been documented that women actually have higher rates of PTSD compared to men. Um, that may be due to um, the impact of the nature of the traumas that they experience or um, having multiple trauma experiences. Um, so just something to point out there too. Um, it also is likely to, to access to services. Um, I see the question there. I'm absolutely uh, uh, able to share this. Or I think I'm able to share the slides. I'll, I'll ask Ms. Dent about that. Um, but I, I was, am more than happy to share these. All right, so one thing I think as we're all kind of joining here together is important to note is that, you know, of course, there's some real cost to PTSD as well as other mental health um, conditions. Um, so why not seek treatment, right? Um, as, as we know, it might not be that easy. Of course, there's stigma and negative messaging around mental health. And again, I think forums like this are doing such a great job to um, combat in that way. Um, but there still remains concerns about confidentiality, security clearance, um, for folks, um, as well as we've kind of had mentioned here today, even about the demands of work and home and childcare issues. There have been a lot written, of course, around the impact of the pandemic on those issues for women specifically in the workforce, um, women veteran uh, in particular, um, as well, um, can struggle with, you know, not having childcare, not having childcare available for their sessions. Um, even if they're um, children at home and they're using telehealth, it still means being in a private space to access, um, right? It's not just a given that doing telehealth will improve access, though it does to some degree. Um, certainly finances, time off of work, and concern, of course, about whether well, treatment will be effective. This is not necessarily therapy that folks always want to do, um, understandably, um, to, to talk about things or to get some help for um, things that have happened or things that they're struggling with. Um, and I think getting the word out about the effective treatments that we have and getting access to those treatments are really important. But then the symptoms themselves, right? Avoidance, distrust, irritability, um, depression, withdrawal. Um, these are all things, of course, that can get in the way of seeking care, um, especially um, without having the support around. I also want to note that a lot of studies are still at the very early days of acknowledging multiple marginalized identities that folks share. So as I'm reporting on uh, veterans and women veterans as a whole, um, there's really just beginning to have research that look at the impacts of um, different mental health concerns on women of color, on women um, who identify as um, not straight or LGBTQ. Um, and so in some studies that have recently come out, it's um, of course maybe not a surprise that um, racial and ethnic minority women are reporting more severe PTSD symptoms than white women, um, likely due to the impact of racism and race-based stress and trauma. Um, also among veterans identified as white, sexual minority women reported more mental health symptoms. So really seeing that, again, we can't, you know, sometimes just lump all, all women veterans, all women into one category, but to acknowledge the, um, the different impact of marginalized identities as well. Um, and I also wanted to note, uh, it asked me to, uh, to speak to the impact of the upcoming holidays. So, um, you know, this, of course, can be a time of feeling ingre increased grief and loss, um, perhaps for all of us, for veterans sometimes specifically, um, and sometimes can come also with less access to coping strategies as we all have increased pressure, um, maybe lack of understanding from family members. This is always a, um, a hard time of year for folks going into family events to family members who may not understand um, what the struggles they have for not knowing how to navigate that. 
um, inc potential increase for alcohol use. And so again, um, and, and of course the, the, the shorter days and less opportunity to get together ha that has only been impacted by um, going on almost two years now of, of pandemic living. So all these things coming together can also make this a difficult time of year as well. So important to uh, get to these coping strategies that, or to uh, all coping strategies, sure, but resources. I see um, someone posted in the chat some already. That's great. Um, and I like to share um, uh, particularly these types of web resources. And I'll get to some hotlines in a minute. But some informational websites, they can be really helpful for folks, even um, if they're not sure about therapy or even as I'm starting with therapy with folks, it can be just really important to show that you are not alone here struggling and that um, and that there is hope. Um, so some of these uh, uh, websites can be really helpful for peer support. The Military Sisterhood Initiative um, provides peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, it's it's not psychotherapy, but it can be um, uh, as valuable, if not more valuable, and sometimes to have that peer support from folks that have experienced um, what you have or something similar. Um, National Center for PTSD has an About Face campaign, which is a ton of really great videos that um, can show um, people of different, uh, of different um, genders, backgrounds, ethnicities, um, trauma types that have experienced different things and have received treatment. And so in terms of instilling some hope and to seeing what some of your options are, it can be a really great to even just watch those videos. Um, and, and a couple other uh, websites I've had there too, just for some more information about what to expect and um, again, what help is available. And then of course there are these um, wonderful crisis line and other um, line resources. Of course there's the crisis line there and uh, Maryland's own um, 211 and commitment to veterans lines that has that case management support as I'm sure that you're all aware of. Um, there's a couple other national lines I wanted to add in there, the combat call line for those who've experienced combat in their history, um, as well as the Women Veterans Call Center, which is specific for women's veterans. Um, and again, I'll share these slides and I can also put some of these numbers into the chat so you can have them after I'm done presenting as well. Um, I also wanted to note here, I forget who was saying before about kind of access to, to therapies, but it is important that, um, that there is access to these therapies, right? We can say all day about, oh, go to therapy, go to therapy, but, you know, you know, one therapy is different than another. I am specially trained in trauma therapies. I'm not specially trained in some other types of therapies. Um, and so, you know, important that, that we support folks to get the type of access that they need, and which can be difficult to do. Um, therefore, I wanted to highlight um, some of these um, nonprofits that um, can provide some, um, some care. And I know that we will be talking about, or um, I believe maybe Ms. Wallace will be talking about um, VA specific care. So again, this is outside the VA system, but the VA where I worked for again, nearly a decade um, has some great services as do vet centers. Um, these are other resources that folks can access as veterans. Um, some people have a preference to see outside the VA, um, especially some as women veterans who may feel some discomfort going into a VA setting when they're unsure um, what they might be greeted with in terms of kind of an overwhelmingly male population. Um, but here are some really great resources, um, Cohen Military Family Clinic, uh, Headstrong Project, um, the Gary Sneese Foundation and the Warrior Care Network that has some specially trained um, therapists available specifically for trauma and PTSD related conditions. Okay. And then a note about friends and family. Um, I, I know that many of us, whether we're veterans or not, probably have veterans in our lives or folks that are struggling just in general with mental health. And just a, a good rule of thumb there is if you're noticing something to listen without judgment, Right, that you know, we may. I know I'm guilty of this of just wanting to to jump in, to fix, to to solve, to hear some resources, but really just kind of stepping back and listening, um, and to to really allow folks to be um, where they're at and and invite them in to to share with you if they want, and if not, that that's okay too. And it's also helpful to educate ourselves on veterans' issues to not make assumptions. Um, to not ask intrusive questions. I know of a lot of veterans that talk about how um, people will just ask a lot of questions just because they want to know their experience and ask sometimes um, uh, questions that are just inappropriate to ask of someone um, about their experiences. So again, ask if they'd like more information, but, but perhaps not to intrude on um, them sharing their experiences if they're not um, ready to do so or not wanting to do so with you. 
Um, there are, it is important for those folks that are caring for, for veterans or for anyone struggling with mental health that you get your own support and self-care. So I have a link there for, um, for families um, and for um, other caregiver support. Um, and there's, um, as many of you may know, um, NAMI in Maryland um, has, uh, you know, great organizations both nationwide and state and, and resources in different counties um, to help connect to other families and friends in terms of support group. And there's also um, even some opportunities for some specific support for um, friends and family members of service members and veterans. So I'll just um, leave it with my contact information. Again, in my center, we are um, in the process of developing some, not just um, pro bono and low fee services, we, many of us have been trained by or at the VA um, and have some of that specific expertise and um, also are developing a way to help share and connect people. Um, so I saw the, the Vet Center call center on there for, for after hours. Um, support that's great and um, just I think more resources we can have where we're all sharing and trying to connect people so I think that's where a lot of folks get lost too they might have um oh can you hear me okay um so just you know that that's so we don't want people to fall through the cracks where they're ready to get some therapy and support or they're ready to get some help that we just want to make sure that we all know kind of a, a no closed door right that we can all kind of help folks to get to where they need and have folks have options um so i just really appreciate your time for me to give some of that broad overview today and just if anyone has any questions from a clinical nature or for help getting folks connected um, to resources i'm happy to be of service so thank you so much so lisa thank you so much for that um i mean very very helpful information a lot of things that i wasn't aware of so really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us this evening and we have your contacts and we'll certainly put folks in contact with you and, and you know allow you to be a reference for us uh so with that I know that we had uh, the chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus, uh, Chairman Daryl Barnes, Delegate Daryl Barnes, who popped on. I just wanted to give him a second to um, bring some greetings this evening. Okay, it looks like he may have left. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Ms. Nicole Wallace. I, I see her on the screen. Uh, I, I, I see that she has her licensed clinical social worker um, letters behind her, but you know, she's a native of Baltimore, Maryland, and she's also a licensed minister of the gospel at, at, at Morningstar Baptist Church of Catonsville. She's a graduate of Coppin State University and University of Maryland School of Social Work, where she is specialized in working with families and children. Having over 25 years of social work experience, she is currently a supervisory program specialist for Health and Human Services, Office of Refugee Resettlement. Nicole is excited about how uh, her vocation leads her to work in the ministry and the community. And so with that, uh, Nicole, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet with you all. It's hard following behind uh, Lisa uh, Carlin and that wealth of information that she has specifically for um, the veteran women's population. So thank you so much for that. And then most importantly, thank you to all of the women and men who served. Um, we appreciate your service and we're ever so grateful to you. So on this evening, what I wanted to do was to really just kind of focus in on the need for um, three particular things that I want you to take away with on this evening as a clinician. Um, and for the most part, um, Ms. Carlin has talked about it at length, but the first is to be tuned in. I recognize that there are some challenges pertaining to um, veterans, particularly women, vet, women veterans, to even acknowledging the fact that they may have had some mental health uh, issues or challenges to begin with. For so long, you know, your employment was contingent upon that. You know, you're even being able to stay perhaps in your career of choice if you are still in the military is contingent upon that. 
And so um, not to mention the fact that we've been conditioned to kind of keep mental health quiet. And so coming from a trauma uh, based uh, perspective myself, I recognize that um, then as a woman, so often before you even join the military, there are other traumas that you have faced. If you think about the ACEs studies and all of the, the different um, exposures, trauma exposures that um, we have had and that women have had particularly to include um, sexual trauma outside of the pressures that then come sometimes associated with the military. You've been kind of taught to not share anything. Um, and then there's some conditions that maybe even have you thinking about some of the issues of sort of like a rites of passage. Well, this all, this happens to, it's a part of what you do. It's a part of the, the, the narrative. Um, and so a lot of these behaviors um, and exposures are often normalized and uh, women are kind of thought that, you know, there's no reason for me to talk about it. The other challenge that we have um, around women's issues as well um, and mental health issues is that we kind of take this approach often of take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. So you pray about it. You talk to a good friend about it, maybe, um, and then you kind of hope that it goes away. But then we don't realize and recognize that the headaches that we're suffering from, the inability to sleep, um, not wanting to eat, isolating from with friends, um, being angry and frustrated um, and a short fuse, if you will, um, towards your children and or loved ones. Those things are... Um, kind of thought of, of, I'm just, you know, having a moment. But when those moments turn into days and those days turn into weeks, there's really um, a challenge that's going on that needs to be addressed. And so again, that's where we lead to my first point that I want to share with you is that, you know, you should just tune in, tune in to the fact that this maybe has been going on for a while. Um, and that it's okay to recognize that there's some differences going on with you and inside of you and to go and talk to someone. Then the second thought that I just want to leave you with is that you want to also then tune up. And so I appreciate forums like this that give um, women veterans the opportunity to, again, normalize this behavior, find out what resources are there, particularly if they have been engaged um, with mental health services, and then uh, recognizing where they can to go to be engaged. Um, in preparation for this, I was talking to a good friend of mine who is a retired, recently retired major, U.S. Army major, and she's also a physician's assistant. And she, um, just this summer, as a result of COVID, she re-enlisted um, after having retired to go back to serve, particularly in the area of women's health. And one of the things that she was sharing with me is that um, so often the, the women will go and talk to their primary care physician about what's going on with them and how they're feeling and maybe prescribe medication for that. But then they don't go and follow up with therapy to really talk through some of the challenges that led them to the emotional feelings that they were having to begin with. So that's another thing that I just really want to um, hone in on to you. It's one thing to go and get that physical care, but it's another thing for you to really take the time to follow up and um, recognize that despite the myths that are there, despite the cultural norms that may have existed that have prevented you previously from wanting to reach out, that it's okay. And that given the fact that on top of um, all of the normal life stressors that um, everyone is suffering with, with the COVID-19, with the uh, being a, a, a sandwich generation of having to be a caregiver as well as a parent, um, with having to be the the lunch the lunch lady, the the principal. Um, and, and then uh, do laundry too and all those other things that you weren't necessarily all accustomed to doing, that it is essential that you put in some time for self-care. And especially because 
um, as female veterans, you guys have other issues that, again, you've been exposed to, but yet you may have been taught to suppress just because of the exposures that you've had during the time that you served. And then finally, I would want to really um, encourage you to stay tuned. And to stay tuned, that means to stay glued in, to really work on building your resiliency, a network of friends and family that you can reach out to, a network within your local community, be it um, through your um, delegates offices. Thank goodness, you know, thank thank these delegates this evening that thought it not robbery to put this on that are trying to ensure that there is additional resources in place for um, causes just as this and really seize those opportunities to seek the support and the help that you need. So that's all I really wanted to share with you on this evening. I believe there's gonna be an opportunity for us to yield perhaps a few questions. And if so, I'll be standing around, I'm sitting around for a while to be able to engage in that opportunity. So thank you so much for inviting me and I look forward to chatting with you all further if time allows. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, uh, very, very helpful information. And, and thank you for hanging around to, to answer a couple questions that may pop up. Keep, keep an eye on the chat. Some questions are actually coming into the chat and some of them you may be able to answer there, but I know that there will be folks that may have other questions and we're gonna give them an opportunity to, to ask those. So before we transition to our, our last speaker, I, I once, once again, want to give a shout out to, um, you know, my colleagues, Dele Delegate Heather Bagno and, and, and Delegate um, Ben Brooks, uh, my, my ECM colleague, who also is a Vietnam veteran himself. Um, for I really appreciate him being on the call and, and all of the advocacy work that he does on behalf of veterans. And then I know that uh, Dana Burrow was given a shout out earlier, but I got to give Dana an extra shout out because Dana is like just everywhere, does everything. She's just an incredible advocate and resource in the Maryland Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, Dana, you, you can write me a check later, but no, I, I really okay. appreciate, you know, all that you do. Um, you're, you're just phenomenal. And, and so thank you so much for, for dialing in and being an important part of this conversation tonight. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the Anne Arundel yeah. County um, liaison for the Veterans Commission, uh, Pete Smith, and who's a who's a Marine and currently serving, and and Pete has just been an incredible <laughs> advocate for for veterans um, all across Anne Arundel County, uh, helping uh, you know sponsor legislation and um, just being helpful in in so many different ways. So Pete, um, I know that um, you, you're you're always out there. Um, fighting the good fight. So um, thank you for what you do. And so before we go to our, our, our last panelist for this evening, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the Army Nurse Corps because I see the Army Nurse Corps is just like, you know, enforced tonight on this call. I mean, they most, most of them have their faces um, not showing, but I really appreciate you being um, a part of this conversation. Hopefully some of the information that you gained tonight, you will actually be able to put into practice and what you do to support, you know, soldiers, sailor, airmen, and Marines, and uh, Coast Guardsmen and what you do every day. So I really appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to um, be a part of this conversation tonight. And thank you for what you do, um, serving our, our military members and their families on a daily basis. So with that, I'm going to transition to our final panelist tonight, uh, Ms. Gloria Dent. Uh, Gloria Dent is a retired uh, command sergeant major in the Army. Uh, she served multiple combat tours, I believe six, but I might have the number wrong. Uh, but, you know, as she transitioned from the military, she continued to serve working for the Billy One Commission, where she helped, um, you know, disabled veterans uh, find employment. And even even after she retired from the Ability One uh, Commission, she's still helping veterans find meaningful work in what she does with her, both her nonprofit and her LLC. And most recently, Gloria was appointed to the Board of Education for Anne Arundel County so she can 
focus on helping the next generation. And so without further ado, I want to um, turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Gloria Dent. Thank you for the great introduction, Delegate Rogers. I hope everyone can hear us. Uh, it has been a great uh, experience being in the military so that you know that you uh, can uh, adapt. I, I think that's the right word for this afternoon. I would be remiss if I did not tell you that this is not saving the best for last. Uh, our two pan uh, panelists earlier, um, Dr. Uh, Lisa Carlin and Dr. Nicole Wallace are legends, not only in healthcare, but uh, also taking care of our wounded, ill, and injured veterans. Uh, but tonight, I want to talk to you about uh, women's health care and the importance of women health care. If you know a veteran, if you see a veteran that is a female a woman veteran, uh, it is important that you express to them that they can get care, care is available to them. Uh, the uh, Congress has passed a tremendous amount of legislation that allows uh, gender specific health care. And that's what I really want to bring you uh, information about this afternoon. Want to encourage uh, you to talk to all women veterans and ensure that they're enrolled into the health care. I uh, spent a lot of time in the military and as a uh, woman veteran, it was a lot, uh, it was difficult for me to travel. So this afternoon, I wanna kind of share with you my personal experiences. So uh, as you know, a lot of women in the military have successful careers. A lot of them have things that they endure uh, that is difficult to talk about because women are very, even though it sounds like it's a lot, they're very far and few in between. As a uh, young private in my organization, I was one female uh, deep in my platoon. Uh, and out of, the, out of the entire company of 127, there was only four females. So it's not like you're gonna really have a lot of people inside your organization that you have to talk to. So when things occur within your life, it is very difficult for uh, you to find a battle buddy that is another female. So you do have to entrust into your uh, male counterparts and that's okay. Uh, but do they understand the uniqueness of women veterans? Probably not, but they are very supportive. And I can tell you that uh, my uh, brothers in arms, shoulder to shoulder, I, I, I can never tell you that uh, they didn't always have my back. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I uh, encourage uh, Delegate Rogers to be in the position that he is, is because he's always had my back. I can always call him day or night. And I know that uh, unequivocally. Now, that doesn't mean I can have a conversation with him about issues concerning female and, gen and gender specific areas. So that those are some challenges that I experienced early on. Well, 27 years later, uh, I'm in the military and now we are uh, at the top of what the uh, military calls is the senior uh, service. And so between officers and enlisted, the amount of people that you're able to talk to, especially women, it gets even further away from. So those areas and those uh, withdrawals that you have and the, the opportunities that uh, Dr. Um, Carlin talked about to go out and speak to someone, those diminish even more so. The opportunity for you to share your experiences that uh, um, Ms. Wallace talks about, those, uh, those opportunities diminishes. But now Congress has did something which I think is really neat. In 2019, uh, they passed legislation that's now VA is required to have what they call gender specific health care. It is up and running at every VA center there is a women's health care. And I know that it works because I am a member of it. Uh, but out of the 2.3 million women veterans that they know for a fact as of 2019 that they have, less than 700,000 of them are enrolled into uh, the VA health care center. And that's not okay. That's not good because VA, uh, contrary to what uh, people like to believe, does offer a tremendous amount of great health care. I just want to share with you that um, VA does offer a full suite of uh, gender-related health care. And one of the things that's really uh, unique is IVF, I, um, and it's called in vitro fertilization. It was, um, it was one of the things that uh, a lot of individuals that are in the military, they never think about having um, children until you know, they're getting ready to transition out of the military. And at that point, it's very expensive for you to go into in vitro fertilization. So I want to thank all of the congressmen uh, and congresswomen and men that got behind the um, uh, Committee uh, on Veterans Affairs to ensure that 
given the exception of policy that in vitro uh, fertilization was uh, open to veterans. Uh, then also there's a, a great thing that's called emergency contraception. And that's important because uh, it's hard to transition out of the military where everything is available to you and you don't transition into the VA healthcare system, then there's a, there's a series of things that of, of unfortunate events occur. As you heard earlier, uh, one of the speakers talked about uh, women are, are twice as likely as males to be home, to go uh, to, to deal with homelessness. And so one of the things that they talk about is emergency contra contraception. You do not have to be enrolled in the VA in order for you to get the uh, emergency contraception. It is available. Uh, if you do have your DD-214, you just walk into the VA center and you can get it. Uh, and then last thing I want to talk to you about is military sexual trauma. The military sexual trauma hotline is there. It does not have to be, have to have been uh, uh, physical sexual assault. It could have been mentally, uh, but sex, sexual assault occurrences that happen to you in the military. Uh, right now, Congress has legislation that they're talking about. It's called the Military Trust Act. That is going to go all the way back to uh, women that in, uh, that uh, left the military as early as 1965. Uh, that is extremely important because. Uh, a lot of women were um, involuntarily discharged during that time because of pregnancy or Planned Parenthood. And so if you were in the military anytime between 1951 and, and 1975, then um, there, is a, there is an opportunity um, for you to be able to have your, evalu have your um, discharge evaluated. Uh, I do discharges. Everyone probably on this call knows that, and I do it. Uh, it's a free service, and we offer it as a free service because I'm passionate about our veterans getting the health care that they need. So uh, last but not least, uh, there is legislation that's going on that's talking for women. It's called uh, the Women's Trust Act. I do hope that it, it does pass because what it does is allow uh, vet women veterans as you're transitioning out of the Department of Defense that they have to have holistic wraparound services as they transition into the VA system, especially as they are uh, transitioning uh, and they had any kind of required any kind of supported treatment, alcoholism, uh, dependency, any of those things. So those are things that I know that will help women veterans in the future. But the one thing they have to do is they have to register, they have to get enrolled, and they have to be encouraged by uh, their fellow friends and people back home. So when they transition back into your communities, uh, be able to tell them that definitely go get enrolled into the VA system. And with that, I will close out. I know that uh, there's a lot of questions that was going on in the chat box, uh, but please know that we will go to the Facebook uh, on Delegate Rogers page and we'll answer all of the questions uh, that's in the uh, Facebook page, as well as uh, get a uh, um, information paper out to you about the things that was talked about tonight. We've asked Dr. Carlin uh, to put her information inside the chat as well as uh, uh, Ms. Wallace. And so you'll have everyone's contact information that briefed this afternoon. And thank you for allowing us to uh, speak with you this afternoon. So Gloria, thank you for that, that um, very, very helpful information uh, with regard to some of the things that, um, you know, veteran services that are, that are currently offered. Uh, I think I know that there are probably a number of folks on this call who weren't aware of that. We have a time for a couple questions, but before we go to the questions, I want to give uh, Delegate Ben Brooks an opportunity to uh, just bring greetings uh, on behalf of the Maryland Legislative Black Caucus um, and his role as a member of the executive board and as a veteran. So uh, Delegate Brooks. Uh, th thanks, Colonel, and I, I really want to uh, personally thank you for bringing forth this most important symposium, you know, it, it really is needed and, um, you know, and it, it's going to serve uh, many, many fe female veterans well. Uh, here again, for, for the record, I'm, I'm Delegate Ben Brooks. I represent the 10th Legislative District in, in Baltimore County. And I'm, I'm uh, one of the members as Delegate Rogers on, on the Executive Board for the Legislative Black Caucus. And I'd like to bring you greetings, you know. You know, oftentimes I, I say, uh, you know, the veterans, uh, you know, we, we serve our country with honor, serve uh, our families with pride, but we serve our maker with reverence, you know. So I, I don't care which theater you're in, you know, uh, Korean, Vietnam, Iraq, you know, Afghanistan. I tell folks uh, <laughs> uh, different, different mud, but same blood. So, no, we, we're there fighting and protecting the interest 
you know, uh, uh, of our country, you know. So here again, uh, Colonel, it, it's truly is great. This is some awesome information that has been passed out tonight. And um, we we want to, we really thank you for it. And thank you again, keep your eyes on the pride, prize and keep doing what you do for veterans. Uh, well, one of the things that I, after this, I like go, I, I try to sponsor a bill every year, every year that's going to favorably impact veterans. So thanks again, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Deller Brooks. And, and, and you must have been reading my note cards uh, because actually one of the things that I was going to sort of kind of cl close on before we take time for just a couple questions are, you know, 22, 2022 legislative goals. And, and there are some areas, and I'm just going to mention the, the topical areas that we're looking at for this upcoming 2022 session, mental health and suicide prevention. So there's some legislation that we're going to be sponsoring um, as a Veterans Caucus to talk about those specific areas. Um, uh, impacts to veterans and their families. There, there will be a number of uh, pieces of legislation that will in, impact, you know, that aspect. Um, uniform services retirement programs, reducing and eliminating state taxes on uniform service retired pay. I have a bill that's going to focus on mm -hmm. on that piece of legislation, and then um, veterans entrepreneurship. Um, there's some, some things that we're going to be looking at there to try to make uh, veterans opportunities a little bit more um, helpful for some of our veterans who are entrepreneurs. So those are just some of the broad areas that we're going to be focusing on on 2022. So I just wanted to let folks on this call know, and I know that we have folks that are on the various veterans commissions, uh, you know, serving in the, the different jurisdictions across the state that are either watching on Anne Arundel County television or participating via base Facebook live stream. And so we encourage you to go to your respective delegates in your districts and say, look, we really need you to support this veterans legislation. You know, because you got folks like myself and Delegate Brooks and, and Delegate Bagno who are certainly going to do the heavy lifting, but we need to support our colleagues and we need you to work back home on behalf of veterans that we'll be bringing forth. So with that, are there any questions um, from anybody on the audience that um, has a question that we can ask one of our panelists? Before we before we close out for the evening, okay, I'm not seeing it. So what I'll do at this point is, again, thank Dr. Carlin, Ms. Wallace, uh, Ms. Dent for the I mean just awesome information that was provided. Um, you know, you say that you often hear that you learn something new every day. I learned a lot this evening. And I really thank you for, for the information that you shared. Uh, we will take, as, as Gloria mentioned earlier, the information that was provided. We'll roll it up. We'll get it to all the folks that are on the call. If you have additional questions, if you put them in the chat, if you put them on the Facebook Live, we will certainly uh, make sure that we respond to those questions events like this don't just happen. So I want to thank uh, my chief of staff, Nicole Butler. I want to thank the folks from uh, Anne Arundel County, um, the county executive's office. Um, I saw a number of them on the call, on the call earlier this evening, Anne Arundel County Television for carrying this live. Um, and for, again, all of the participants, hopefully you enjoyed the call this evening and hopefully you took away some helpful information. So with that, uh, once again, happy 246th birthday to the United States Marine Corps and happy Veterans Day to all of you on this call. Good night. Thanks and good night, Colonel. Great symposium. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Delgar Rogers. <laughs>